welcome everyone. Governor, Senator, County Executive, Congressman, and dear distinguished guests, I would like to welcome you. I am Mustafa Tanser. I'm a tri-continent man doing business in tri-state. Tri-continent means as a Turkish, which is like Asia, Euro-Asia, born in Germany, Europe, and I'm an American also, so I'm representing three continents over here. On behalf of Delaware Council, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this plenary session on politics and social justice. Social justice is a celebration of diversity and celebration of our constitution that guarantees equality of your equality regardless of your background or religion or ethnicity or national or national your origin. Our prophet taught us if you are rest while your neighbor remains hungry, you are not one of us. And also our holy book Quran teach us watch over the orphans, care the poor and help the homelesses. We cannot be a good Muslim without being a good man, without being a good people. This is universally accepted among every society and every religion. Treat children with compassion, fight against persecutions, torture and murder, and fight against the injustice. This how the world will know that we are a good people. The whole earth has been entrusted to us. All of its beauty and resources have been given to us to use and care for. We are responsible to pass it on to our children. Possibly the greatest sickness of our time is living in excess. Taking what is not needed, thinking only of oneself and not looking to needs of others. This mentality strips our world of the resources we need to live. Every time we take more than we need, we leave less for someone else. We live in a multicultural society that gives no regard, the, no race, no religion, gender or culture. However, the growing gap between the rich and the poor is a source of great conflict. The growth of this disparity serves only to breed horror and the terror. If we, if we want to leave the world a better place for our children, we need to make a choice to do what we know is right now. Beginning with our local communities, then our country, then finally the world. We need to invest in making the world better. In this regard, our lawmakers and the politicians need to take steps to restore our social uh, justice. We should not be a country where people go bankrupt because they cannot afford their health care. We should not have the people going to jail because they cannot pay their child support. And we should not be a nation where men, women and children cannot receive a good education simply because they cannot afford. We need to stand up and fight for liberty and the justice as our founding fathers did. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a star start panel here that can not only reflect on social justice in Delaware, but can actually make the necessary changes to make our society more harmonious. Our keynote speaker is second term governor, Mr. Jack Markle, who has not only hosted the first ever iftar in the governor's mansion this year, but has also transformed our economy to make it one of the best in the country. I am a Delaware-based businessman. I know firsthand how the economy has grown, has, has recovered in this Delaware country, in Delaware State, under the governor. Distinguished guests, I know you are not here to listen my lecture. Now I would like to pass the word my dear friend, Dr. Muktedar Han, who will going to moderating this session and for further instructions. Thank you very much again. Thank you. 
Mustafa Tunja, thank you very much. He's one of the most important leaders in our community. And one thing with Mustafa is if you need help for no matter what reason you call him and he's always there. A couple of my students are going in January to Morocco to run a training camp for girls in Morocco. They, they, they needed some help to buy shoes for the girls in Morocco and Mustafa was the biggest donor that I could find. Uh, thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, the organizers of this panel are very grateful to all the panelists who have agreed. Uh, it took some coordination, but we are delighted that we could have all of you here. This is perhaps the first Muslim event where nearly the entire leadership of the state of Delaware is attending and speaking. We debated to a great extent whether we should call it the governor's panel. Uh, but we couldn't confirm whether Mazhar is going to run for the governor of Pennsylvania or not. That's why we didn't call it. We have the former governor, the present governor, and inshallah the next governor, and down the pipeline, uh, another governor. I'm talking about you, Brian. <laughs> governor in training. So without much ado, I would like to invite Governor Markel, who has been a great friend for the Muslim community, and he's also been uh, uh, a person who has been willing to reach out to all the minorities and all the marginalized communities in the state of Delaware, and is best suited to speak on the issues of po politics and social justice. Governor. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and Professor Khan, thank you very much. Uh, I actually first met Professor Khan. I was not yet uh, governor, but I met Professor Khan and his, uh, and his son over the ping pong table in, uh, in, in Newark, and we had, some, uh, we had some great games, and it was a, it was a nice way to uh, uh, meet each other, and I just, I've appreciated your, uh, your friendship uh, ever since, so th thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here with Senator Carper and uh, Congressman Carney and uh, State Senator Brian Townsend uh, and the leadership of the Muslim community here in Delaware. I want to make particular mention of Anas Benati, who is the director of Del Delaware State Housing Authority. And uh, you mentioned that you have some of your students who will be going to Morocco. Uh, Anas is a native of Morocco, uh, still has family there. and. Um, I'm sure he's happy to like bake all of the Moroccan cookies and do whatever else uh, you would like before you go. But uh, Nanas does a great job as the head of the State Housing Authority, and I'm, I'm very uh, lucky to have him in our, in our cabinet. You know, the moment that uh, we all find ourselves in now is a bit of a paradox, or at least it feels like a bit of a paradox. Because our society, both our government and our public's consciousness, we have made some, some good progress, some real progress in our never-ending mission to achieve social justice. Now, we define that mission as building a country that very much reflects our most fundamental value, that every, everybody deserves a fair opportunity to reach their potential, to work hard and to participate in our communities while living with dignity and safety and in happiness. I think in many ways we are closer to that ideal than we've ever been. You know, many of, many of us grew up at a time when it was legal to discriminate based on race or religion or ethnicity. We rejected those laws and recently I signed legislation that added sexual orientation and gender identity to those who were protected from discrimination in Delaware. And the list of milestones of progress is long, but the fact is that many among us still lack the opportunities of a just society. We have a lot of work to do, from ensuring access to a high quality education, to addressing the inequities of our criminal justice system, to stopping discriminatory behaviors that remain too common in housing and in other areas. And most importantly, we've got to continue to strive for a society in which law-abiding citizens feel comfortable when they express themselves. And we need to make sure that all people are welcomed within our borders. So despite all of our progress, though, we also see some disturbing and often frightening signs of divisiveness that threaten the pursuit of our country's ideals. And it's evident, among other ways, in some of today's anti-immigration rhetoric. Division, whether by race or religion or ethnicity or any other characteristic, 
breeds fear of each other, and it inhibits compassion. And I don't think there's anything that's more dangerous to our ideals than that. Now, we've seen this many times before, directed at the Japanese, or the Irish, or the Jews, to name but three. And the recent national dialogue regarding Syrian refugees also highlights this threat. Now, I think reasonable minds can very much differ on matters of international security and humanitarian policy. Who should con conduct the reviews of applications for refugees? What documentation is required? What actions most broadly give us the best chance of resolving the crisis in Syria? But those questions are different from the, what I would call, alarming enthusiasm with which some politicians, and especially those running for president, have jumped to the harshest possible stance against the Syrian refugees. Many of them have sought to scare Americans, and they have made bombastic demands for changes to our policies with no basis in fact. And perhaps most frightening were those ap explicit appeals by some candidates to discriminate against refugees on the basis of religion. And that is an idea that directly contradicts one of our oldest and dearest values. Some went as far as suggesting support for creating a database to register Muslims. And we must do no such thing. Now, this should not be a partisan debate. There's no party affi affiliation attached to the Statue of Liberty which is famously inscribed with the appeal to give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. We are not a country that turns away families fleeing devastating violence and horrifying living conditions. People so desperate that they will run toward the harsh winter of Europe and put small children aboard precarious boats because in their minds, they have judged that that is safer than the chaos that has engulfed their homeland. Now, we are a nation that prides itself on the diversity of our citizens, and we believe that our differences in religion and national origin and viewpoint are actually our greatest strengths. That has never been a matter of partisan difference or national debate. It is a part of the very fabric of our national identity of who we are. And when we abandon that fabric, we abandon our hope to live in peace and freedom and prosperity. So we have got to see these people who were fleeing their homeland, not as foreigners or outsiders, but as mothers and fathers and children who were seeking a better life. We've got to live up to the aspiration of John F. Kennedy, who eloquently spoke at another time of great national fear of those who were different from us and he said, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Now, as you know, I've spoken out about my feeling regarding the nation accepting refugees who have been properly vetted from Syria or any crisis, any country in crisis of any age, of any religion. And while my office helps provide a platform to talk about it, the fact is state officials don't really have a legal ability to impact refugee policy, but we are all part of this democracy. You know, the voice of justice, whether in defense of refugees or the homeless on our streets, whether in opposition to racism or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or xenophobia or homophobia, the voice of justice only resonates in a democracy if it is heard loudly from all the people. And to me, that's what this conference is really all about. Because I strongly encourage all of you to engage with your elected officials and prospective candidates for public office. You've got to make your voices heard through the traditional media, through social media, and continue to convene gatherings that bring communities together and to foster an understanding among people of different backgrounds. We must all do our part. Just as all people of goodwill must speak out against terrorism, including that terror which is conducted by extremists of any religion, I implore you 
Don't shy away from sharing your ideas or from getting involved in both faith-based and secular community institutions because don't shy away because you think I'm only one person and what difference can I possibly make? You can make a big difference. Now the Muslim community in particular, I believe has much to offer in these discussions and debates. At a time when some choose to spread fear, we would frankly all do well to consider passages from the Quran, calling on us to celebrate our diversity and live with love and respect and compassion for all people. In the Quran, in Surat al Maida, how'd I do to us? Is that good? All right. He had me practicing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that applause really belongs to Anas because it, it was his pronunciation lesson. But in that, in that part of the Quran, it says, had God willed, he would have made you a single community. But he wanted to test you regarding what has come to you. So compete with each other in doing good. Compete with each other in doing good. Now that passage epitomizes what we should want for our country because following it will, make, will help us make our nation a more just place. You know, we have been given the opportunity to live in this incredible melting pot and to see the, both the challenges and the extraordinary possibilities of the fact that God did not make human beings into a single community. And I, we have got to respond to this test both ambitiously and pra pragmatically. We've got to find the root causes of injustice and inequality and, and then make it our goal to eradicate them. And that has been, thank you. And that has very much informed my work as governor. And I, as a government, we can and we've got to set the bar high. We don't accept the status quo, and I'm, ex I'm asking you not to accept the status quo either. We know from dramatic changes in our society since generations past that no matter how intractable the status quo may be, change is possible. And it does not come from governments alone. One of this country's great historians, a guy named David McCullough, and he wrote, he says, among the most difficult and important concepts to convey in teaching or writing history is the simple fact that things never had to, ne things never had to turn out as they did. Events passed, they were never on a track. Nothing was foreordained any more than it is right now. And what that means is the future that we want for our kids and ourselves and, and for our grandchildren and their children, that future is very much in our hands. It's what, by the way, one of the reasons I'm pleased to see a number of young people here today. It's our, these are our choices to make and we've got to choose between love and fear, between acceptance and division. And gatherings like this give me a lot of hope that we will make the right choice. Now let me close with this. In 1963, Martin Luther King went to Birmingham, Alabama. And he went there because it was the most segregated city in the country. And he went to lead a nonviolent protest. And when he got to Birmingham, he was arrested and he was put in jail. When he got to jail, he received a letter from members of the clergy there in Birmingham. And in their letter, the members of the clergy complained to Dr. King. They complained that he had come to Birmingham at all. They said he was stirring the pot. They said if he had just waited, everything would have turned out okay. So he was there in prison, and he didn't have anything to write, to write on but the fringes of a newspaper. And he had nothing to write with but the stub of a pencil. And he wrote this, he wanted to write a letter back to the clergy. And he wrote this amazing letter back. And in it, among many other things, he wrote that we will have to repent in our generation, not just for the hateful actions and words of the bad people, but also for the appalling silence of the good people. We will have to repent, not just for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but also we will have to repent for the appalling silence of the good people.
Now, I close with that for a reason, because we have a choice to make. We can leave this day and say that the Muslim community in Delaware put, put on a great event, and a lot of elected officials, the top elected officials in the state came and spoke, and that's a great thing, and it probably wouldn't happen in other states, and we had a lot of people attend, not just people from the Muslim community, but we had students from St. Andrews and, and you know, other people from throughout Delaware, people who were interested in social justice. And isn't that a wonderful thing that we got all those people to turn out? That is one response we could take from this day. But the other response is to say, it's up to all of us to make sure that we put in the energy. Because refraining, refraining from doing the bad, as Dr. King said, is not sufficient. Having the energy and the commitment and the determination and the persistence to get out there and do what we must do to make the promise of social justice real, that, will, that is what we must be all about. And I have spent now not a lot of time, but a, you know, more and more time, as uh, Professor Khan mentioned, with this community. And I am hopeful. I am optimistic. This is a rapidly growing community. This is a community of rapidly growing importance, not just in numbers, but in its message, in its voice. And I know that I speak for myself, and I'm guessing I speak for Senator Carper and Congressman Carney and Senator Townsend and all the elected officials in the state when I say that we look forward to working with you to make this idea of social justice not just a slogan, not something that just fits on the cover of a convention program, but something that is real to all of the people of our state. Thank you very much for having me.